Hi everyone. In this video, I'll be talking about VQVAE. A lot of research works use VQVAE for learning meaningful latent representations. Its vast usage makes understanding it thoroughly very important. And in this video, I'll be doing exactly that. I'll talk about why it's needed, intuition and theory behind it, and then implement and train it. We'll also go over how to generate data after we have trained a VQVAE module. So let's jump right into it. In variational autoencoders, we encode each point as a distribution in the latent space. This, together with the constraint of KL divergence with an assumed prior of standard Gaussian, ensure that these distributions don't move away from each other and are wide enough. In case you need a VAE refresher, I encourage you to check out my video on VAE to understand these points in more detail. As a result of these constraints, we were able to ensure that we could easily sample points from our continuous latent space and generate different variations of data, the keyword being continuous. For generating numbers, we used a latent space with smaller dimensionality and achieved decent results. But if our goal is to generate complex data like natural scenes, a lower dimensional latent space will end up being a weak or noisy source for our stronger decoder. Most likely, the decoder would end up generating an average image of the data. You could say that why not increase the dimensionality? That's simple, right? But then the total number of points in the continuous latent space would be a very high value, and our model might find it difficult to learn from. Imagine trying to ensure that all points sampled from a 256 dimensional latent space generate a valid output. But continuous latent points aren't that bad. I mean, they do allow us to interpolate between different data points in a very smooth manner. The flip side of the argument here would be that real world data is actually not really continuous. We have sets of objects, each set belonging to a different class. Take the case of a cat and a person class. It might not make much sense to interpolate between them because points between those classes in the latent space would be invalid images in the real world. Even the common data that we work with, be it speech, language, or image, either are or can be represented by a discrete latent representation. To summarize this section, in VAE, we learn a continuous latent space. In VQVAE, instead of learning this continuous space, we learn a discrete set of points using which we represent our data. This also gives us the additional benefit of sparsity. Let's now look at the different components of VQVAE, which more or less is pretty similar to the other variants of autoencoders. The only component that differs is an embedding space, which we call as the codebook. This embedding space consists of K embedding vectors, which are the d-dimensional vectors using which we'll represent our data in the latent space. The second component is the encoder. And since we'll be working with images for now, it'll consist of blocks of convolutional layers. It'll take in an input image and generate a feature map. Now let's assume for the time being that our feature map is a grid consisting of d-dimensional vectors with d being the latent dimension, which is also the dimension of our codebook. In case the dimensionality of encoder output is different than d, we add in a one cross one convolution layer to ensure that our encoder output shares the same dimensionality as our codebook. Now we need to convert this encoder output into our latent representation using the codebook vectors. To do this, for each d dimensional vector in the encoded output, we find its nearest codebook member and replace it with that codebook vector. So let's assume we compute the distances between all pairs of encoder output vectors and the codebook vectors and find that the nearest member of F1 is E5 and that of F12 is E2. Then our quantized encoded output will be this. On the decoder side, we don't use the encoder output at all, but instead pass to the decoder the quantized encoder output. This goes through the decoder, which in our implementation will be stack of transposed convolutional blocks. It then generates the output and we backprop using the reconstruction loss, which will be MSE. Once you train this network with the reconstruction loss, unfortunately, the model will not learn much. In fact, when you inspect the gradients of any layer before the decoder, they would be zero. The backprop happens perfectly from the loss through to the decoder, but at the point where we find the nearest embedding vector, the gradient becomes zero. Let's quickly understand why that's the case. To take an example, Let's pass a two-element vector through an argument node. 
Now this function will return 0 when x1 is less than x2 and 1 when x2 is less than x1. If we assume x1 less than x2, then when we change x1 by a very small value delta, what would really be the change in the output of the function? Nothing, right? It was earlier also 0 and since x1 and x2 are far apart and the change is so small, x1 would still be the smaller value. So if changing x1 and x2 by a small value does not change the argument output, obviously the gradient will be 0. In fact, the gradient will be 0 at all points apart from when x1 equals x2, where it would be undefined. Here is one of the ways to tackle this, which the authors also use. I'll show it using how it's actually implemented, because that's how I found it easier to understand. Let's refer to our encoder feature map as A and the quantization output as B. What we are doing is passing A through a node which uses a non-differentiable function to compute the value of B. What if we rewrite the computation of B as this? Detach just ensures that the variable is separate from the computational graph and no gradient is passed along that node during backprop. Now if we represent these operations via a similar graph, we'll see that nothing changes in the forward pass. The a and the minus a paths cancel out and we still get b equals f of a. But because detach changes how backprop happens, for backprop the computation is b equals a, since everything within the detach vanishes. And what essentially happens during backprop is that the gradients are passed from b through a as if there was an identity operation between them. This is called straight through estimation, where we simply pass the gradients from decoder to the encoder. The authors mention the intuition behind the usefulness of this unaltered gradient passing. They say that since the encoder outputs and the decoder inputs are in the same space, the gradients of the latter contain useful information regarding how the encoder should change its output to lower the reconstruction loss. Although we have overcome the issue of gradients being zero, but now there are no gradients being passed to our embedding vectors. This is because the backprop for the reconstruction loss never goes to the embedding vectors to update them. We need to find some other mechanism to update the embedding vectors. Now, given our codebook vectors are like representatives of the latent dimensional space, we can look at them as being centroids and regard the whole quantization operation as clustering the encoder outputs into K clusters. Once we do that, it's easy to see that we could update the embedding vector by bringing them closer to the encoded points assigned to them, just like we would update the mean of the cluster in clustering. This is the second loss term the authors use, which is also referred to as the codebook loss. SG here is stop gradient which is implemented in frameworks through detach and is meant to ensure that its operand is treated as a non-updated constant during backprop. A third loss called commitment loss is also used where we treat the embeddings as constant and bring the encoded points assigned to them closer. The authors mention that this loss is meant to ensure that the encoder commits to an embedding and prevents the encoder outputs from fluctuating between different code vectors and bring stability to the training. Both the commitment and the codebook loss can be seen as us trying to pull together the encoder outputs and the codebook representations. We add a scalar beta that represents our relative importance between the two. That is, whether we want to put more emphasis on codebook to adapt towards encoder or the encoder to adapt towards codebook. One could argue that since the probabilistic model is the same, that is a latent variable z producing data x, there should be a KL term wherein we try to minimize the KL divergence between Q of z given x and P of z. Q of z given x would be the distribution of discrete embeddings that our model predicts and P of z would be the prior for our discrete latents. However, in case of VQVAE, our prior Pz is uniform and hence 1 by k for all values. Our predicted distribution is a one-hot vector, which means the KL term will end up having only one term which will evaluate to log k. Since this is a constant, we ignore the KL term in the loss. We will quickly write an implementation of our VQVAE model. Our VQ VAE model class will be having an encoder and a decoder. For encoder, I'll just use two convolutional batch norm ReLU blocks. And since I want to visualize the embeddings, I've kept the latent dimension as two. And here I'll just use some pre-quantization convolution layers and that will also ensure my encoder output gets converted to the latent dimension output. I've just used three codebook vectors here. 
After the post quantization convolution layers, we add the decoder portion, which is just similar to our encoder, except we use transposed convolution blocks. I've kept the final activation as tanh because my images are normalized from minus one to one. Let's now write the forward method. Here we will first call the encoder and the pre-quantization convolution layer. Now we'll reshape it so that the latent dimension is the last dimension to allow us to compute pairwise distances. Once we compute the distances, we'll use the argument function to select the index of the nearest codebook vector for each element of the encoder output. Then we'll use the index select method to get the quantization output by selecting the embedding using the minimum index that we found. We then compute the commitment loss and the codebook loss using the detach function for stop gradient and scale the commitment loss by beta factor. Finally, we reshape the quantization output to the same shape as encoder output and feed it to the decoder, which then generates our output image. Once we train this model on the MNIST dataset, we'll see that the model starts to reconstruct images by using the embeddings as an indicator of the intensity of that pixel, given that it's a one-channel image. Here, we use three embeddings, and the model ended up assigning the encoder outputs in regions of black to one embedding, in regions of gray to another, and white to another. Even though we have the latent dimension as two, given the simplicity of information required, our model mostly just uses one, since most of the encoder outputs end up being closer to the x equals y line. By the end of training, it'll end up reconstructing the input images and bring the encoder outputs and the corresponding embeddings closer and closer to each other. In this case, the dataset had simple images and a codebook of size three was enough. But obviously for more complex scenes, we would need larger number of codebook vectors. Even if all we did was just add color to the digits of MNIST, like if we simply take an image, create three copies, and scale each of them by random scalar values, then concatenating them as RGB channels of an image, we'll end up getting a colored number. Then we'll find that with smaller number of codebook vectors, the model gets the numbers reconstructed, but not the color. And only once we increase our codebook size, we are able to reconstruct the number as well as the color. In the colored case, the embeddings will obviously now start to contain color information. And you will observe that when the color change is small, like for the two images of one and the two images of zero on the left, the encodings won't change much. But for the two images on the right, the color difference in the output is larger, but so is the difference in the embedding output. Now that we have trained a VQVA model, how do we generate data? So let's assume our quantized encoding output is a 8 cross 8 grid of d-dimensional vectors. If we flatten this, we get a sequence of 64 d-dimensional latent embeddings. We'll be training a model using the sequence of these latent embeddings that we obtain from quantizing the encoding of our input data. And the goal of the model would be to learn the probability distribution of zi 
given all the previous latent embeddings that it has seen. Kind of how you would learn a language model based on sentences. We have quite a few options available at hand for the kind of model and how to decide the context for each prediction. We could even pick an autoregressive transformer. But since we'll be working with some of them in the upcoming videos, I thought for this one, let's give our good old LSTM a try. As I mentioned, we'll convert the quantized encoder output to a sequence of d-dimensional vectors. For my implementation, I just decided to have a context size of 32. So my input for the LSTM would be the previous 32 embeddings. I'll add an FC layer after the final hidden state with the number of codebook vectors k as my output dimension. Target would be the ground truth, 33rd embedding in the sequence, and the whole model would be trained using cross entropy loss. I also add in a start token and a pad token whenever my context does not have 32 embeddings. Once I train this LSTM, I generate a sequence of 64 embeddings, where for each generation, I take the past already generated embeddings, feed it to the LSTM model, and then sample from the distribution obtained after softmax on the final FC layer output. These embeddings are then reshaped to a grid and passed to the trained BQVAE decoder, which then generates an image. And after training the LSTM for about 10 epochs, I get these results. If you train for more, we should still see improvements, like here the color is not really as uniform and it kind of blends multiple colors in together. But I would say these are decent results. All right, so that brings us to the end of this video. I covered everything about VQVAE, right from how it's different from VAE, its theory, implementation, and I hope you now have a better understanding of it. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you learned anything from it, do press the like button and subscribe to my channel. It's a growing channel and it'll be really great to have your support. And I'll be adding videos every week, so see you in the next video.